Um, hi, everyone. My name's Aaron. Um, I'm a newish member of the uh, Play Games BD team based in Mountain View. Uh, and I'm very excited to be here today to talk about uh, player engagement in games and share some insights from research we did with players from around the world that touches on the connection between long-term engagement and player happiness. So one of the reasons I'm particularly excited to sort of um, be up here and talking about this is because um, I had a little bit of experience working in the games industry. I've worked on both mobile and console and PC. And I'm familiar, I think, with the problem that we all face, which is doing what's best for the business versus what's doing, best for, uh, doing what's best for our players. And I think that striking this balance is a huge challenge that we don't necessarily talk enough about. So I'm excited to kick off the conversation today and see where it goes. So quick overview of what we're going to be talking about in the next 20 minutes. First, we'll level set, and we'll talk about why we care about player well-being in the first place. And then we'll address some sort of more sweeping generalizations uh, around gamers and engagement. Then I'll share some learnings from Play's recent research uh, with real gamers, specifically focusing on um, how games have impacted their overall happiness, both the good and the bad. And finally, we'll switch gears, and we'll talk about some tactical suggestions uh, that you can leverage in order to better balance um, player well-being with long-term engagement to ultimately be more successful. OK, so let's dive in. First question is, why should we care about player engagement? Well, on the play side, we care a lot about it, um, about player engagement. And the reason is that our, it's our mission to build a successful ecosystem with happy users for the long term. And until recently, we at Play, I think, have been talking about this um, and doing research and trying to deliver on this at an ecosystem level. Um, what I mean by that is applying to both apps and games. But as we all know, what motivates someone to use a game is very different to what motivates them to use an app. I might try two to three different games in a month, but I'm not going to try to do two to three different banking apps unless something's gone horribly wrong. So recently, um, we at Play have started to become much more intentional about better understanding not only our users, but also our players, and specifically, what makes our players happy. Now, when we think about this statement, the previous statement, which is you know, building a successful ecosystem with happy players for the long term, I think there are really sort of three components to this. There's successful, which for all intents and purposes is, is very much tied to your success and therefore refers to revenue. There's long term, which would refer to retention, engagement, sustainability. And finally, there's happy, which is, is the literal happiness of the people who use our products. Now, I'm sure on some level we all agree that these metrics very much go hand in hand, and that you monitor, I would be surprised if you didn't already monitor revenue and engagement quite closely. But I'm curious, um, can I see a show of hands, anybody who tracks player happiness as a metric? Couple, anyone else? Okay. And actually, of those of you who put your hands up, how many of you um, actually have quarterly goals against player happiness? Anyone? Quarterly or yearly goals? Okay, a few. Um, so for those of you who put your hands up, that's great. Um, I know happiness is not something that's particularly easy to track, but it's great to see you're focusing on it because we do believe that there is a correlation between long-term engagement and player happiness. And so for those of you who didn't put your hands up, uh, which I think is most people, it's, that's also interesting. And it's, please hang tight because we're going to be sharing some insights with you later that will hopefully inspire you to sort of think about this more proactively. Another reason that we at Play care about player engagement is because you, game developers, care about it a lot as well. Um, in a recent Play survey, uh, retention and engagement were two you know, top priorities that you identified to us, um, as even over and above something like new player acquisition. And this makes sense, right? Because we've also heard from you that you want to um, create relationships with players that last for years, not just days or weeks. Um, and clearly, engagement and retention are crucial to achieving those goals. But beyond this, even if we look at larger trends occurring within the games industry at the moment, um, increased competition, rising UA costs, you know, all these things, um, this increased focus on, intention, um, on uh, engagement and retention means that today we're designing games, even at the earliest stages, which will have longevity. And even when we're thinking about like, game mechanics, um, characters or storylines, we're thinking about like, how can players engage with us for a really long time. And with engagement and retention being the true predictors of future success, it's understandable that we're very focused on understanding these metrics. At the same time, however, um, we sort of wanted to take a step back and look at this from outside of the industry. And um, the thing we sort of came down on was it seems that a lot of people outside the industry feel that we are too focused on player engagement. 
Um, and actively believe that we are prioritizing engagement over player happiness. And the criticisms are often focused on sort of three areas which are listed here. Negative interactions in gaming communities, um, controversial game mechanics, and finally, the time and money that players spend in games. Unfortunately, this narrative has led to some pretty broad negative tropes um, around games and gamers, leading non-gamers to believe potentially that games are bad for people. Um, in fact, it's their belief that um, games can be isolating, they can distract players from their real lives, uh, and that people sometimes regret the time and money they spend in games. Um, I'm sure we've all heard these criticisms, if not, maybe experienced them firsthand. So with all this talk around player engagement, sorry, we're going <laughs> to tackle these now, um, talk around player engagement versus player well-being, we at Play wanted to see how players themselves you know, actually felt about the games they play. So we launched a research campaign uh, with real players from around the world to better understand the impact that gaming had on their lives. To do this, we spoke with players from the UK, the US, South Korea, who spend several hours a day or week playing games, who play games on mobile or uh, mobile and console or mobile console and PC, um, and who have purchased something within the last six months. We spoke with a small group of players in depth uh, and in their own countries, sometimes even going into their living rooms and sitting down with them, watching them play, to get interesting qualitative feedback. And as you can imagine, we were excited to see if there are any sort of commonalities across geographies, ages, genders, that sort of thing. And the results were very interesting. OK, so let's get to it. First, in talking to players in depth about what made their gaming experience great versus not so great, we were able to identify three key insights around player engagement that, interestingly enough, correlate with some of the negative sort of tropes we talked about earlier. The first insight revolves around the generalization that games isolate players from other people. By a quick show of hands, anyone think this is true? No one, great. Um, and we agree with you. Um, we actually think that um, there's a big shift within the industry at the moment, uh, especially across console, PC, and mobile, um, where games are becoming increasingly social. And the important insight from research shows that today, for many, playing games is primarily a social and shared experience, with competition and collaboration emerging as some of the most powerful drivers behind play. In fact, games are often seen as places where players can go to engage in shared passions, um, and basically like work together on a hobby. As you can see from the quote here, um, one of the players in the study um, wrote this down. He said, it's nice to feel these people understand me and we have shared interests. And I think it's how a lot of people feel who play your games. Like they found you know, their people, their group. That said, it's also important to call out that our research showed not all players um, said their social gaming experience was positive. Um, First, they said, um, in fact, sorry, two major themes really stood out. First, they said that bad actors were poisoning the well for other players. Um, and this is something that sort of resonated with me. Uh, I've definitely seen this in games that I've worked on um, and or as a player firsthand. Um, and it's a very hard problem to combat. Um, but how you manage bad actors in your games or don't can have a very significant impact on your gaming community. Secondly, they said that games which encourage more aggressive, more aggressive styles of gameplay can give them anxiety. It seems that oftentimes players can, be, can, be, can become anxious if they feel sort of a social pressure to play more or spend more in order to progress. So clearly, as games become increasingly social, it's up to us to think about how we can create healthier, happier communities and celebrate cooperation as well as competition. And we'll touch on some more tactical ways to actually go about doing this later. OK, our next research insight revolves around the second generalization that we talked about earlier, which is that games distract players from their real lives. It's a tough one to answer when you're in the industry. <laughs> and the answer, I think, is probably not that surprising. But what was interesting from the research study was that many players actually said that games were a welcome distraction from their day to day. For them and for you know, many hundreds of millions of people out there, games can offer an escape from things like stress, um, a terrible commute, or you know, you know, something as mundane as when you're meant to be practicing for a presentation, you're procrastinating. Um, and there are lots of other benefits that players can get from playing games. Um, for instance, 
Games can take people um, out of their day lives and they can feel, you know, give them a feeling of control and accomplishment. It can also be a source of creativity or immersion in a story. That said, while many of the players we spoke with focused on the positive distractions games can offer, there was one big area of consistency uh, when it came to you know, where games could do better. And that was around notifications. So notifications, when handled poorly, can be perceived um, by players and some of the players we spoke with as an unwelcome distraction from their daily lives. For example, they express irritation uh, if they receive too many notifications from the same developer in, the space, in a short space of time, um, or if they receive notifications at suboptimal times, um, like when they're at work or school, or you know, even just when they're spending time with their families in the evening. Um, and in my experience, I think that notifications are incredibly tough to get right and very easy to get wrong. Um, and it's also an area that we at Google are very focused on at the moment. Um, because we recognize that today users are becoming increasingly aware of and critical of how um, we use notifications, and therefore just trying to be super thoughtful. In general, we tend to see that players find notifications helpful if they improve their in-game performance and competence. It obviously varies based on what your primary motivation is within your game. There's a few motivations listed here. Um, a good example is if, let's say for example, you play a location-based game and you play with friends, you're going to want to know if there's like a raid about to start nearby or if your friends log in, that sort of thing. And this makes sense because, again, this information is perceived as being useful to the player and it improves in some way their in-game performance. But there's more to come on how we can improve our notification strategies in a few minutes. And finally, our last key research insight revolves around gamer generalization number three, which is uh, one I'm sure we've all heard about a battle with firsthand, which is the players regret the time and money they spend in games. And the answer is, as you can imagine, complicated. It's partially true, because in fact, what we saw in the study was that many of the players we spoke to actually saw games as more of a hobby. And this is a sort of hobby, using the word hobby there is a distinction that I hadn't actually thought about beforehand. Um, so I actually polled some of my colleagues in the Play Games BD team. And we talked about the difference between entertainment versus hobbies. And the conclusion we came to was that, unlike movies or TV, which are more passive forms of entertainment, games require your focus and participation, and therefore we should think of them more as hobbies. And unlike other forms of entertainment, we practice hobbies, because we're interested in, find joy in them, um, or if we're just trying to acquire new skills or knowledge or experience or that sort of thing. So when players think about the time and money they spend in games, it makes sense that for some of them, it feels like they're investing in a hobby. Um, and this is an approach that we could all take um, as long as the content that you're providing to them is in some way enriching their lives um, and happens on the player's terms. Still, some of the players you spoke with did feel remorse in situations where they overspent or for unintended impulse purchases. And some of these games express a desire to have greater visibility um, into how much they spent. For example, you know, aggregate spend on a month or weekly basis. I also love her second comment, which is, I'd, I'd love to see my husband's purchase history. <laughs> okay, so we'll come to ways that you can help players feel like they're more aware of and in control of how much they spend, both time and money, very soon. Um, but an interesting exercise that um, is worth trying at some point is, think about a time that you went into a game intending to make a purchase, and then did. And then think about a time you went into a game not intending to make a purchase, and did. Um, and just compare the two. And I, I, do this myself, and the thing that stood out for me was I can clearly remember the times I went into a game intending to make a purchase, and actually what I purchased in that transaction. So similar to spend, when it comes to time players invest in games, many players, although, although not all, um, said they would like more agency to make better decisions around the time they spend with you uh, in your games. So taking signals from players and giving them the information they need to make this decision in a way that isn't invasive or unnatural um, is important, and it will make them feel like they're in control and, frankly, that you care. Okay. So now that we have a clear idea of the areas in which players see value in games as well as the areas in which they struggle, um, let's switch gears and talk about what we can actually do about it. So as I said earlier, we at Play fundamentally believe that player happiness and long-term retention do go hand in hand. And by intentionally building off the sort of positive uh, emotions listed here, um, like social connections, um, competence, and agency, we can both improve player engagement and player happiness at the same time. 
As many of you know, digital well-being is a focus for Google. Uh, we made some exciting progress to help players have healthier relationships with their devices and give them sort of more control. Um, but the OS and platform can only go so far. There's just sort of some inherent flaws with you know, some of the stuff we've been able to set up in terms of um, managing notifications for players, even like giving players a reminder when they play for some length of time. It can cut off in the middle of a session. So what I'm trying to say is that you as developers are more directly connected with your players and your games. And therefore, for us, the best way to go about drastically improving player well-being in our games is by working more closely with you. Um, so the topics here are ways that we can improve player happiness together. Okay. So based on player input from the players we spoke with in the research, we have three tactical suggestions for how you can improve player well-being. First, help players build meaningful social connections. Social connections are obviously more important to some games than others, um, and cultivating thriving communities is core to a lot of your engagement strategies. Um, and of course, as we touched on in the research before, if a game includes social components like guilds or chat groups or you know, even team leaderboards, um, it's important to create a safe and positive environment for all of your players. And here are a few ways you might go about doing this. So first, be bullish about establishing community standards. What I mean by that is, be clear and upfront with your players about the kind of community you want them to uphold. Because at the end of the day, you are the steward of your community. At a minimum, consider something like a formal code of conduct. Um, you know, ask players to agree to be good actors. Um, the nice thing about this is it will actually drive um, personal accountability on their part. The second thing is create safer communities. Um, feeling safe in the community will mean higher player satisfaction and therefore engagement which is good for your business and clearly a better return on investment for the expensive community tools and teams you have to maintain. To do this well, make sure that you have a process for reporting and evaluating and then dealing with bad actors in your games. Um, and make that process really clear to players so that when you have to take action, it's not a surprise to them. And the final point is uh, reward model behavior where you can. Um, we've seen this work well you know, outside of games at school or work or something. And it's highly effective. So consider rewarding good actors with you know, public status marks or some sort of incentive, um, and then hold them up as examples to the rest. The second suggestion we identified was to offer players more focused and intentional play. And what I mean by that is give players more control over when and how they engage with the game, especially via notifications. So for instance, Avoid annoying or overwhelming players with too many notifications by asking them to signal to you how often they would like to receive them and make it easy for them to snooze notifications if they need to. Another thing you can do is when you choose to send notifications, make sure that you're giving players you know, sort of useful feedback that in some way improves their in-game competence. Um, and ultimately, like, what I think players are looking for is to decide, help them decide if and when to come back to your game. Now, if you've got an understanding of your players uh, and what their main motivation is, you can actually do this for them. Um, but also don't be afraid to ask them themselves. Um, get them to signal to you when they want to receive them. Either way, it's important to be incredibly thoughtful about how using notifications, as I said, is a channel that we've seen users become increasingly critical of, um, and it's one that we at Android are giving them more control over, so it makes sense to be much more thoughtful. Um, and the final point is give players transparency and a feeling of control into their engagement and spending habits. Helping players see how much time and money they spent will empower them to make smart decisions about how they engage with your content. A play we follow suit by giving users more control um, too. For instance, you know, creating tools for helping players set budgets. Um, you can actually do this yourself if you go into the Play Store and go down to account. You can actually set a budget for yourself. And it's somewhat surprising actually how quickly you can hit that, those budgets sometimes. One um, sort of tactical idea that we've sort of been floating around the team is um, find ways to use subscriptions if possible. Um, since subscriptions are a, a recurring small payment, um, we find that they don't break the bank for users. Um, and because they're regular, you know, they expect them, they know that they're coming. And there's also sort of this added incentive to come back into your game to make the most on that investment. For better time management, um, some developers have seen success building sort of these more natural reminders into your game. Um, for when you play too much. And for example, this is an example, this is like when a game becomes less rewarding when you've been playing for a certain length of time or played a certain number of games. 
This not only helps pace progression, but also prevents player burnout. Okay. So to wrap things up, we believe that happy players will play your game for longer. We also believe that by making small incremental improvements to your games, by being more respectful of player preferences, you can retain users for longer and improve their well-being at the same time. At the end of the day, end of the day making play happiness a priority is good for your business, it's good for the ecosystem, it's good for the industry. Um, and on the play side, of course, you know, I, th I think it's safe to say we're just getting started in this research, especially on the game side. So we really want to hear from you about what you're doing to in some way improve the experience of players in your games and how you're thinking about improving your communities especially. So ultimately, we want to work with you uh, to learn from one another and build a happier ecosystem. Um, I will say, you know, I think we're going to be hanging out by the Green Parrot after this. Please come and talk to me if you're doing something cool in this area. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and I think that's it. Um, thank you.